Now use your word to mold our hearts as you desire. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as we ended our last lesson, we begun to look at the faithful church of Philadelphia. Specifically, we had looked at the self-description that Jesus has, had used as he described himself to the church that opened the letter, and then uh, we will continue forward from there this evening. So we're in Revelation chapter 3, and if you're ready for the word of God, can you please signify that by saying amen? Amen. And if you're able, can you please stand for the reading of God's word, the word of he who is always faithful. And in chapter 3, we'll start with the seventh verse, and it said, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Thank you. Amen. So, we'll start as we often started. Uh, we will look at the church itself, uh, the church in Philadelphia. And we have a very little knowledge of this church beyond uh, what is contained in this letter. There are some other uh, things that we do know about it. But again, as with the majority of the churches noted here in the book of Revelation, it's believed that this church was founded via Paul's Ephesus ministry. A few years after the writing of this particular letter, Ignatius would pass through uh, Philadelphia on his way to martyrdom in Rome. He would write a letter of encouragement to the church there and a letter of an instruction to them. Also, there were some Philadelphia Christians who were killed, uh, who were martyred with Polycarp in uh, Smyrna. So, uh, and what we know about the longevity of this church is that this church lasted for centuries. It lasted all the way up until the early 14th century when it was overrun by the Muslims. It was a very faithful church and it was very fruitful. The city, about 30 miles uh, southeast of Sardis, uh, it's the youngest of the seven cities that is written to. Its name literally means brother lover, and it's named after a king's brother that showed the monarch great loyalty. It had an excellent strategic location. It was built up on a hill about 800 feet above a very important roadway. But it was not primarily founded as a military outpost. The city of Philadelphia was founded. Its intended purpose was to become a Hellenic culture and language center. It was found, founded by people that wanted to spread, for lack of a better word, the religion of the Greeks. The, uh, the language, the culture, the thought processes, the philosophy. Uh, so it was, in, in essence, a missionary outpost, outpost for the Hellenization of Asia Minor. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, last week, we, or last time we met, we spoke to the idea that this was once part of the Lydian kingdom, a very rich kingdom. But these people that went to this part of the world to Hellenicize the, the locals were very, very successful. And it wasn't long after their arrival that they were 
Philadelphia was fortunate. Uh, it was at the some junction of several large trade routes. And remember, it was on a postal road. Any city on a postal road is a very important city. And it's located at the edge of a peculiarly named geological uh, feature. It's called the Katakī Tamini, which means uh, it's the, the part land. And all that means, uh, it was in a location that had a lot of volcanic activity at one time. A lot of black, rich, fertile soil, and ideal for vineyards. And there were, there, even though it was a good uh, place to grow stuff, it had some drawbacks. It had a lot of seismic activity. And remember that uh, we had talked about Sardis being destroyed by an earthquake. Well, Philadelphia was affected by that same earthquake. It survived. Sardis was rebuilt. And Philadelphia didn't have to be rebuilt. It was uh, damaged, but because of its newer construction, it uh, did survive, but it was closer to the epicenter. And it felt tremors for many, many years. So it, it led to an interesting psychology on the part of the Philadelphians. Lots of the Philadelphians left the city at night and didn't live there. They deserted their homes and built huts and uh, <coughs> tent type uh, structures to sleep in at night because they were scared of another earthquake. The people that stayed in the city came up with all sorts of ways and ideas. It's pretty interesting if you actually look at it. Ways to protect themselves from uh, from damage due to earthquake. Ways of reinforcing their walls. Ways of supporting their homes, etc. So, even though the major earthquake that I speak of was 80 years prior to the writing of this letter, the people of Philadelphia, a majority of them, are still living outside of the city. They're still scared of earthquakes. So, uh, and uh, it's, it's actually become part of their mentality. And if you read about the Philadelphians, you'll read about how almost everything they did became centered around these uh, earthquakes and the thoughts about earthquakes. As with several other cities in the region, because of its financial support that was provided to it after the, the big earthquake, there was erected in Philadelphia a monument to uh, Caesar Tiberius. He also had uh, rebuilt Sardis and there was a monument to him there. Jesus now will go directly as we, as we finish the, the review of the city. Jesus now goes directly into the commendation. Normally there would be a concern voice, but since he has no concern over their deeds or over their works, he immediately moves on and commends this church for four realities that characterize who they are. This is what characterizes this congregation. So it's important for us to look at those four realities because it would be good for those things to characterize our congregation. Jesus will say that they have little strength. He will say that they are keeping of Christ's words. He will say that they have not denied his name, and he say that he will commend them for their perseverance. Four things. Now don't take the phrase little strength in verse 8 to be a negative. It's not. It's not meant to be a negative. It means, it means that they are little. They are strong. Not that they have, not that they're not real strong. It means that they are little. They're a little church, but they are a strong church. So it's a combination, combination to their strength. Not big, but they have a powerful impact on the city where they're located. They uh, most undoubtedly, their members are probably from the lower socioeconomic class, but still, they have a successful. Uh, mission in the city. The, this, this is a church that would share Paul's feelings as expressed in 2 Corinthians 12.10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For I am weak, then I am strong. And that's a uh, Probably the same type of philosophy I would imagine that this church is. The church has a spiritual power about it. I believe that people are being redeemed. 
Lives are being transformed and the gospel is being proclaimed by this church. The second con con you know, commendation is uh, the, that this church has kept my word, Jesus says. They are like Job said in 12 or 23:12. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. This seems to be the attitude of those displayed in Philadelphia. This is the attitude that uh, Martin Luther displayed when he was on trial. He said, my conscience is captive to the word of God. What a great phrase. Our conscience can be captive to the word of God. Each and every day. So, uh, there's a, this is a, when, they, when Jesus says, they kept my word, that's an indicator, that's a direct comment in regards to the obedience of this church. It's proactive in nature. These are people that have kept his word and they have done it, uh, they have done it in an aggressive way, I believe, not, not, in a, not in a mean way, but in a way they have had to fight to keep the word. So... By keeping their word, what do you do when you keep the word of Jesus Christ? Well, it demonstrates your love for the Savior. When you keep that word, you're kept. Uh, he, 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 can, he can work in and through you. The third thing is that Jesus says that they have not denied, not denied my name. And undoubtedly, this would be a church that would be under pressure as we read here in these source verses tonight, they would have been under pressure to denounce the name of Jesus, but they had remained loyal. No matter what the cost, they have, they have not denied his name. They are like the uh, tribulation saints that we'll read later on in 1412, who refused to take, who will refuse to take the mark of the beast. This was a church that refused to recant its faith. And then finally in verse 10 it says, They kept my command to persevere. The NIV probably expresses that a little bit better. It says, You have kept my command to endure patiently. Patient endurance. These folks endured and persevered faithfully through all the trials and difficulties that they experienced. See, the endurance that marked Jesus in himself, in his life, demonstrated great endurance, and that's uh, something that we need to consider in our own life, and our own walk. Now, because of this faithfulness that marked the church in Philadelphia, Christ makes several, what I'll call, astonishing promises to them. The first one is in verse 8. He says, See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. Their salvation is secure. Their entrance into both the blessings of salvation by grace and into Christ's future messianic kingdom is guaranteed. Again, as we've uh, seen earlier, there's also an opportunity in the inference here that the opening of this door symbolizes this church having the opportunity for service. Uh, oftentimes in scripture we see the phrase an open door depicting freedom to proclaim the gospel when a door is open. Paul, especially, he would say in 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9, as he uh, he writes to, he, he, he's explaining his travel plans to the, the church in Corinth in 16, 8 and 9, I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost for a great and effective door has been opened there are many adversaries, but Paul, you know, he didn't worry about the small stuff. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 2.12, he writes, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. And to uh, the church in Colossae, Paul wrote in 4, 2, and 3, he says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open us a door for the Word. These words uh, could be very, very appropriate to the church in Philadelphia when you consider.
consider all the roads that run through the city on, on, any, on any large uh, trade caravan there would be a lot of people who weren't of the upper crust, a lot of workers, and I imagine I would, it would seem like to me that this church probably had a ministry trying to, to work with those type of people. Very strategic location, an excellent opportunity to spread the gospel, and it seems that that is what this church is doing. Now in verse 9 we find the second promise made by Christ to this church, and he says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. As with those in Smyrna, the Christians in Philadelphia faced great hostility from unbelieving Jews. Uh, Ignatius would later come to the city of Philadelphia and actually uh, debate some of the unbelieving Jews there. Because of their rejection of Jesus Christ as their Messiah, the Jews are not a synagogue of God, but as it says, a synagogue of Satan. The inference here is that their claim to be Jews is in fact a lie. They cannot be Jews racially, culturally, ceremonially, they may have been Jews, but spiritually, they are not Jews. We've read and studied Paul's description, Paul's definition of what a Jew is in Romans 2, 28 and 29, where he said, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision, circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Amazingly, Christ makes the promise that some of these, it would seem that some of these very Jews that were persecuting the Christians at Philadelphia would in fact, it says, come and worship before their feet to know that I have loved you. An interesting phrase. The picture of bowing at someone's feet is a picture at this time in history of total defeat and submission. Remember, we, we, we've talked about uh, kneeling at the feet of Jesus. Uh, you know, a king sat on a throne. And a throne in the ancient world wasn't like this. A throne in the ancient world you, you couldn't see the king unless you looked up. You had to look up to see the king. So the idea of worshiping at someone's feet is very, very graphic, very, very... Uh, it, it indicates the idea of being defeated, being totally submissive to someone. The enemies at the Church of Philadelphia would utterly, totally be eventually vanquished, humbled, and defeated. And this imagery is from the Old Testament and it describes yet a future day when unbelieving Gentiles will bow down to the believing remnant of Israel that is described in Isaiah. And I think in this instance because of Philadelphia's church faithfulness, they would in fact be rewarded by the salvation of some of the very Jews that were in fact persecuting them. See other faithful churches throughout history have also been enabled by the Lord to reach the Jewish people with the gospel of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And in Romans 11, 26 speaks to the day when all Israel will be saved. We can discuss that word all if you want. As in Zechariah 12, 10 it says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me whom they pierced, yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And then the last promise that's made to this church, this faithful church, is in verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, 
I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Because this church of faithful believers has passed so many tests, Jesus promises to spare them from the ultimate test. And the nature of this promise far exceeds just the church in Philadelphia. This promise is to all faithful churches throughout history. The promise is that the church will be delivered from the tribulation, thus supporting a pre-tribulation rapture that is reflected in our own church's statement of faith. The rapture is reflected really in only three scriptures in the New Testament, and none of them speak to the idea of judgment as it should be when you consider a pre-tribulationalism type of belief system. They all speak to the issue of the church being taken up to heaven. Those verses, we'll look at each one. I'll read each one. John 14, 1 through 4, should be on your outline. Let not, not, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, why would have, I, would not, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, in the way you know. 1 Corinthians 15, in the 51st verse says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in the victory. And then from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13th verse, it begins, but I do, want, do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Paul oftentimes writes that, and he means it. When he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, he says that a lot of times, and you know what? Every time he says it, he means it. He doesn't want you to be ignorant. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him Bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be in the Lord. Amen. Of, co of course, we're all familiar that there's primarily three views of the rapture in relation to the tribulation. One that pr proposes that it comes at the end, post-trib, second in the middle, mid-trib, and then, as I said, what we support at our at New Life Family Worship Center, pre-trib. But I want to look. I want to look at the the promises of what is what is said here. First of all, we can see that this that this promise is this test is in the future. It's a future test. It's something that's going to happen, as it's spoken to here in Revelation. Second, the test is for a definite, limited uh, time. Jesus describes it as an hour of trial or testing. He uses an hour to show that there's a limitation upon the time of the trial and testing. Third, it is a trial or test that will expose people for who they really are. There will be, there, I do not believe, there will be very many posers during this time. And fourth, the test in itself, it has a scope which is worldwide. And then finally, and most significantly, it has a purpose. And the purpose is to test those who dwell on the earth. And when you read that grid, that 
phrase in the Greek, that is a technical term defining those who are unbelievers. It's designed as a test for those who don't believe. This is the hour of testing. This is, uh, I believe, Daniel 70th week that's spoken of in the ninth chapter. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, that be, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be the flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm, confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. This is the time that uh, is referred to as Jacob's trouble in uh, Jeremiah 37. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, and he shall be <coughs> saved out of it. Jacob shall be saved out of it. This is the seven-year tribulation period, and I believe that there is every indication that the Lord promises to keep his church out of the future time of testing that will come upon the unbelievers. This is as with any test, or maybe I should say, this is as it used to be with any test since the education system in America has changed. It used to be that there were only two grades possible given in a test, those that pass and those that fail. Nowadays we have those that participate, those that are breathing, those that were com comatose during the passing out of the test, etc., etc.
And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Called, chosen, and faithful. That's a good category to be in. Called, chosen, and faithful. At the other end of the spectrum, though, because there are those that will fail the test, they're reflected in 6, 15 through 17, where it says, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, I like it. This is kind of sarcastic, so it's kind of... <coughs> I like it. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And then in 920, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, nor hear, nor walk. Carry your God in your back pocket. 1611, they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they still didn't repent. And in 1917, then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of, those, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. Okay, so next week we'll continue on, and we'll take a, we will begin next week with an examine uh, with an examination of the phrase. Where in verse 10 it says, keep you from, you know, pull that apart in the Greek. And we'll look at that phrase so we can grow in a, a little bit more depth of what, what it is we're being told here. Okay? Thank you for your attention. It's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of scripture, a lot of material. Any questions? Any comments?